So good morning, everyone. Welcome, bienvenidos. For those of you who want to continue in English, stay put. Las personas que desean escuchar la versión en español, por favor, elegir el idioma oprimiendo el botón en forma de círculo donde dice español en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Gracias. So again, welcome and good afternoon to our live attendees today. We're very grateful that you're here to engage in our webinar, Hablar de Sanar, Sustainable, Trauma-Informed, Bilingual, and Bicultural Integrative Behavioral Health. I'm Dr. Tiffany O'Shaughnessy, and I'm one of the hosts of our webinar today. I use the pronouns she, her, and I'm a white cisgender female in my early 40s with an undercut buzz hair on the left side and chin-length brown hair on my right side. I'm wearing a black top, and my background is a mountain tapestry scene. I'm currently on sabbatical, but I will be returning in the fall as the MFT program coordinator in the Department of Counseling here at San Francisco State University. And I'm one of the co-investigators for this project. I'm working alongside the project's primary investigator, Dr. Billy Cronister, who's the coordinator of our clinical mental health counseling programs, and my co-investigator, Dr. Molly Streer, who's the coordinator of our school counseling program. I'd like to introduce and thank our graduate assistant, Christina Cadillas, who is supporting our technical aspects of our webinar today. Um, you'll see her posts in the chat throughout. And I'd also like to thank our other project assistants, Chinui Igwe and Shirley Sang for their ongoing support. I'd also like to acknowledge that SF State's campuses in San Francisco sit on the ancestral homeland of the Ramatish Ohlone. We further acknowledge that we work on the unceded ancestral lands and waters of many other indigenous peoples and nations in our fieldwork in the Bay Area and around the world. We're committed to ensuring this webinar is accessible to our audiences. Closed captioning is available in the closed captioning option at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If at any time your access needs are not met or become not met during the webinar, please send a chat directly to a host or co-host. Access is always a work in progress, so we appreciate your comments, feedback, and support. This is our fifth webinar of this academic year, sponsored by our Equity and Justice Focused Counselor Training Project, which is fully funded by the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Resources, and Services Administration as part of an award totaling $1.9 million. A couple of additional things before we get begin. If you are one of our HRSA stipend recipients or are interested in receiving continuing education units for your attendance today, please pay close attention to the announcements provided in the chat for sign in and evaluation links. As a reminder, this is a live recorded Zoom webinar, therefore the audience is not visible and the audience can't turn on their video or audio. The chat function though is available for comments, sharing of resources, supportive emojis, et cetera, so you can interact there. Um, to ask the presenter today a specific question, please post your question in the Q&A function. Um, it should be also in the bottom part of your Zoom screen. That Q&A will occur during the last five to 10 minutes of the webinar. So please post your questions in the Q&A as they emerge and the presenter will answer the questions at the end of the webinar. Speaking of the presenter, I am so delighted to introduce you to our speaker today. Dr. Brian Rojas Arroz is an Afro-Latino immigrant of Costa Rican and Panamanian descent. He received his BA in psychology from San Jose State University. Then he earned his master's in counseling in marriage and family and child therapy with a dual emphasis in college counseling right here in our Department of Counseling at San Francisco State University. He then went on and graduated with a PhD in counseling psychology with a specialization in Spanish language psychological services and research from the University of Oregon, the DUC. Uh, his research emphasis is on Latinx psychological well being, immigrant and dreamer experiences undocumented communities, access to mental health and education, critical consciousness, cultural competencies, advocacy, and social justice. His dissertation was titled Undocumented Healing, Strengths and Resilience from the Shadows, and it used testimonials and data as poetry to identify challenges as well as protective factors and psychological strengths of undocumented students. He has over 10 years of experience providing bilingual mental health services and working with Spanish-speaking communities, including children, adults, and families. He was a psychology resident at CU Anschutz School of Medicine and a bilingual mental health provider at Salud Family Health Centers. More recently, he was the director of Latinx and Spanish language services at Reaching Hope, which is a trauma clinic working with individuals and families who are victims of crime, frontline workers, DA employees, social services employees, and others exposed to trauma or at risk of vicarious trauma. Dr. Rojas Arruz is an adjunct faculty member at the University of Denver's International Disaster Psychology, Trauma and Global Health Masters Health, or Trauma and Global Mental Health Masters Program, where he teaches and supervises. He is also a trauma licensed psychologist in Colorado and the co-founder of Inlakesh Counseling, Education, and Consulting. 
Dr. Rojas Araz is a hip hop educator, a dreamer, a documentary filmmaker, a slam poet, an author, and a scholar activist, an all around amazing human. And I am so excited to learn from him today along with you all. So now I'm gonna happily turn it over to him to lead us. What an introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao. Um, you have already done a lot of acknowledgements. So we're gonna go past that. I will recognize that I today stand in Denver, Colorado, which is the land of the Arapaho um, tribe and what it means to you wherever you might be to take a second and recognize whose land you stand on. Today's agenda, uh, we actually have a lot in only an hour. So we're gonna be touching on different things. Um, I don't know that we'll walk out of here experts, but definitely, hopefully we'll give you enough to think about as you continue to do incredible work with the communities you serve. So if nothing else, uh, the following slide uh, will tell you some of the maybe takeaways uh, from both my experience and hopefully what I hope you'll get from today's uh, presentation. We'll be doing a quick introduction of, uh, introduction of integrated primary care, specifically when working with Latinx communities. We'll talk about treatment issues and challenges to care, bilingual and bicultural. Why should we care about it? Why is it something that we should be asking for and something that our patients deserve? Cultural values and consideration and how to work with them. As well, what does it mean to do trauma responsive care in integrated primary care? And lastly, we always gotta take care of the healers. How do we do that in a way that makes sense? And we'll end with a quick Q&A. So the things that I've learned so far in my experiences in multiple and different spaces uh, are people want to know how much we care before they know how much we know. Two, language is not innocent and we need to be intentional with all the things that we do and all the things that we say. Three, we feel with the language of our soul, right? And we're able to experience life differently when we do it in the language which we call native. Three, therapy is about the connection and relationship. What we do in it actually matters a little bit less. So always being able to center relationship over task. Four or five, the space, even if virtual, can be made more welcoming. So thinking about what are the spaces that we're in, what are the things that folks are able to see behind us, around us, when they come into a space with us? And three, plants are always meant to be broken. So why integrated care? If I could have folks quickly maybe think about what are the reasons that we are in integrated care uh, spaces and what are some of the benefits of doing uh, integrated care in general? And you can use the chat to reply to that. Mind, body, spirit connection, absolutely. Reduce barriers, basic needs, access, increase access, meeting people where they're at. Um, yes, all of this, all of these reasons are great, and right. And it really creates um a different space from what we usually see, holistic comprehensive care, right? And for a long time we have acted or have uh, approached health as if the body and the mind were separate from one another. What this does uh, is create barriers for a lot of folks we want to work with. We think of uh, integrated primary care being a one-stop shop. It's cost-effective, increases access, like many of you said. It brings a macro-systemic lens to the work that we do. We're looking at populations and community health instead of just individuals. It is a generalist approach, so it allows us to think quick on our feet and allow us to work with a lot of people that are facing a lot of different uh, challenges. Ultimately, we're trying to create a small changes in a large number of people, which will lead to improved population health. A lot of times, especially when we talk about immigrant communities or documented communities, we do this thing that's called patchwork. And what patchwork means is that they might not come directly to us, but they might talk to the vecino or la vecina or la comadre, right? And what it means when we're able to provide good information to someone that is able to then go on maybe pass it on to their community members. With all the things that are great about the integrated primary care, I think there's also important for us to name some of the challenges. First one is time. Often visits are short. I know that the average session length that I saw when I was at Salud, when I was at Anshin School of Medicine, was usually one or two times, right? Complex patients, they're coming in for multiple things. The model within itself, uh, might never prepare us for what it is that's coming in. 
when it comes to training, primary care physicians state that they have insufficient training in behavioral health. So it allows us an opportunity to become both cultural brokers as well as bridges between the mind and the body. And the reality is that often folks are overusing the services. So it is a challenge still within the things that we do. Because of many of these challenges, there was a call for something that is called the quadruple aim. The quadruple aim in integrated primary care try to address four things as a way of improving services. First is how do we give the best possible care? This will improve patient experiences. Two, at the lowest cost possible, right? How do we make sure that one visit addresses multiple ailments? Three, it will the improvement of population health as a whole. And four, delivering by healthy providers. It always tells me a lot about a space on how we treat the people that are taking care of our people, right? How we're treated within the spaces in which we work says a lot about what's important to folks. And a lot of times we see burnout being a very real thing. Towards the end of this relationship, uh, this presentation, we'll talk a little bit about how to avoid vicarious trauma, how to take care of ourselves. However, even though this was a great idea, it was missing something. And I felt it was missing something as I was going through my residency year. And it was that often there was this idea that was left out, which was culture, right, and context. So the quintuple aim uh, actually was created and was first written about in 2021. Um, and we have the same first four kind of centering things. But the last one, I think, is the one that we're here to talk about today, which is health equity, right, through a context, trauma, and cultural responsive lens. How do we contextualize the folks that we serve? And how do we, are we able to do the first four things without first centering the patients that we work with? As we try to do this work and bring a contemporary aim into the things, uh, into the work that we do, um, we used something called the five A's of primary care. And might be something that you have heard about in the past, might be something that is new, um, but ultimately allows us to bring that fifth lens into the work that we do. The five A's of primary care include things such as assessment, assessing the physical symptoms, emotions, behaviors, biopsychosocial factors, the risks, the attitudes, and the preferences of the people that we serve. The second A is to advise, discussing options. Again, making it a collaboration and a conversation with the folks that we're serving, allowing them to tell us what works best and what doesn't. From there, we agree, and it allows us to have better patient buy-in, which is absolutely important in having positive outcomes. We assist by developing uh, the plan, by creating skills that they can learn, uh, problem solving, and when barriers show up, which they will, being able to be flexible and res uh, in responding to those. And lastly, we arrange. When we're in uh, integrated primary care, we might not be the last therapist they work with, but you very well might be the first. Right, and how do we plant those seeds so folks are able to continue to work and find trust within a system that often makes them feel that it cannot be trusted? As we continue to talk about this, uh, it's important for us to frame what it is that we're allow, able or not able to do within, uh, within our work. A lot of the work that we're gonna do in an integrated behavioral health is gonna be pre-focused interventions. Things like motivational interviewing, refocus, uh, solution focus interventions, Psychoeducation, knowledge is power, and a lot of times just being able to teach someone about what's going on with them can be healing and empowering for themselves. Mindfulness, uh, CBT, and ACT are some of the things that I usually use. I don't expect this to be an all-inclusive list, but just ideas of things that we're able to work with that take into account the cultural background of people, their experiences, and are not necessarily fixed to a specific way of healing. Now that we have talked a little bit about why integrated primary care, I'm gonna shift our focus to talk about Latinx communities, which is uh, what I have specialized in. When it comes to Latinos in the US, there is 62.5 million people in 2021 that identify as Latino. That's about 20% of the population. We have been 54% of the population growth since 2000. Currently, one in every five people identify as Latinx. A quarter of children also identify as Latinx. 
and we are now and have continued to be the largest minority and immigrant group in the United States. To the point where places like California, Texas, and New Mexico now have a majority, majority Latinx population. Assuming that many of you are in California, it means that it is impossible for us to try to pretend that we're not going to be running into this community or that we not, don't need to be prepared to work with the specific needs that they, uh, that they might bring into the work that we do. We are projected to be about 28% of the population by 2060, and we're going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to see. Now, as we think about these numbers, it also makes us think about social determinants of health and what that means in the work uh, that we provide. Social determinants of health tell us that education access and quality, the healthcare and quality that people have, the neighborhoods in which they live, the communities in which, in which they relate, and their financial stability have a direct connection to how healthy or unhealthy we are in our lives. When it comes to social determinants of health, we're talking about disparities that we know exist throughout. The reality is that the color of your skin and your zip code should not be a determinant of how long you live or the quality of life that you have, but sadly it does. When we think of disparities in mental health as a whole, uh, Latinx and Black communities are more likely to suffer from severe mental health issues because there's a lack of detection, which means they are more likely to wait until a crisis is taking place to be able to receive those services. There is a lack of referrals. Uh, there is a high need for clinicians that are bicultural and bilingual. Psychology and the mental health field as a whole is a lot less diverse than even the workforce in the United States. Something about 85% of psychologists and mental health providers identify as white. Something that we need to be part of that solution and thinking about the systems in which we come in touch with, whether it's education, internships, and other opportunities that are given. And lastly, the lack of timely treatment, right? A lot of times we're waiting or folks come and see us when they're in crisis. The wait is such a long time that by the time that we get to them, they're no longer looking for services or they no longer trust us because it took so long for us to get to them. It's also important for us to talk about global majorities. And when I speak of global majorities, is what traditionally have been, has been called minorities in the United States. We have less access to mental health services and utilize them less than white peers. We're less likely to receive specialized care. We're more likely to receive unequal treatment and are more likely to receive inferior treatment. We also see a lot of racism that comes through the way in which we diagnose or the ways in which diagnosis and uh, prescriptions are often uh, used. And again, maybe this is unconscious, but at the end of the day, we got to recognize the re systemic racism that continues to impact the communities that we try to work with. So within this disparity, it brings out treatment issues that I think are important for us to recognize. The first one being Latinx and Hispanic folks are more likely to seek mental health, uh, mental health support at a primary, at a primary care provider. Right, more than likely they came into uh, a clinic because there was an ailment, and while they were there, um, at least in my experience, you come and do a brief screener that makes you realize, well, this person might be depressed or this might be connected also to anxiety. Um, so we might very well be the very first person they ever talk to about their mental health. Now it's important for us not to think or make the assumption that because people don't talk to us, there's no healing going on, right? Communities and communities of color in general have been healing in different ways and traditional ways of healing, ancestral knowledge and wisdom that is passed down. So they are doing things already. However, we might be the first ones that are able to get a hold of them to provide them with the support from a professional. Secondly, poor communication with healthcare providers is often an issue. Um, there is not enough bilingual or Spanish speaking mental health professionals as I meant before. A lot of times there's no communication between the mental health and medical field. And often we see family members doing some of the translating. Um, I teach in a program in which we have a Spanish supervision program in which we really focused on the clinical language that is needed. 
right? The clinical language that is needed for Spanish providers to be able to talk to their clients. The reality is that we don't walk around all day talking about uh, theories or models, or even uh, those of us that have graduated from programs, we picked up that language along the way in English. So being able to understand how to communicate it in a way that our patients can hear it in Spanish is a skill that we need to develop. And how do we develop that? We develop that through reps, right? We gotta be able to continue to uh, work and try to, to mess up and be okay with messing up sometimes. And also a reminder that we don't have to have all the clinical language to be successful at it. Most of the time, even when we're providing services in English, uh, we don't talk of depression as a cluster of symptoms that creates a diagnosis in which uh, scientists have decided that X, Y, and C make it show up. No, we usually say, you know, sometimes life's hard and things happen and there is this deep sadness that we may feel. So reminding ourselves that sometimes less is more and keeping it simple might be the best way in which we're able to connect with the people that we want to serve. And lastly, bilingual patients are evaluated differently when evaluated in English versus Spanish. Latinx and Hispanic people are more frequently undertreated than whites. And a lot of times is something's lost in translation, right? I think it's also important for us to think the ways in which we feel, right? When we experience a trauma, if we're gonna talk about trauma, when we experience a trauma, we experience it in the language that is primary to us. When we talk about a trauma, simply by having someone having to uh, switch up the language they're using makes them get away from the experience. We're able to feel deeper and more clearly when we allow folks to talk in the language which they prefer. And lastly, the somatic representation of mental health, health issues may lead to a misdiagnosis. In a little bit, we'll be talking about trauma, but as we build towards that, even thinking about the way in which we diagnose trauma, the way in which we um, talk about trauma and identity politics, right? How does that come into play into the services that we're trying to provide? So let's see, I'm gonna go to the chat over here. We experience trauma in the language that's native to us, hard that. Uh, absolutely. So thank you all for the words. I'm not going to read all of them because I know that we're tied for time. So with that said, let me ask, what are some of the challenges to service utilization when it comes to patients, right? Because there's, there's two buckets and there's a part that is ours, right? But when we think about Latinx clients, what are some of the challenges for them to engaging with mental health services? Please go ahead and write a couple words into the chat. Uh, things that come up, stigma, absolutely top of the list. Thank you. Sabna, um, what else? Stigma, stigma again, absolutely. Language, immigration status. Fear of being undocumented, mistrust of the system, transportation, culture, right? We know all these too closely, trauma. Uh, they may know that they're not eligible for services and often they might not know what services actually exist, right? There's a lot of times where services are created that folks don't go to uh, for, any number of reasons, including what you have named, but a lot of times it's also not knowing health insurance, uh, access to affordable health insurance, right? So a lot of the things that you have named up here, uh, that you have named are right up here, spiritual beliefs. I think normalization of trauma is something that uh, we need to talk about more often, right? Like, well, we've been through a lot, so we can take a lot, or it's not as bad as what your grandparents went through. So really understanding what um, some of those Challenges and mental health challenges, right? Not, not trusting a system within itself. Now let's switch it over and think about what are the challenges that providers face in providing these services? And it will look something like this, right? We have competing demands. A lot of times it might take longer for us to serve folks in a culturally congruent way. Cultural blindness uh, or unawareness of what it means to work with someone, Latinx. Let's put everybody into the same bucket, right? We are an absolutely diverse group of people, right? We are similar in many ways. And I think that many of our cultural values connect to one another while at the same time, there's differences that are so important 
language for nat native uh, Spanish-speaking providers. Absolutely. I think it's also important for us to recognize that Spanish is not the only language that we speak as Latinx people. There's a lot of indigenous dialects and languages that are still used and living and thriving. And it's important for us to recognize those when we do this work. I know that for me, there were moments in which I was called to work with someone and they were like, oh yeah, just go get Brian, he speaks Spanish. And I would come into a room where a Brazilian woman was waiting for me, happy that someone was gonna speak her language to then recognize that I speak no Portuguese. I ended up working with these folks anyway, right? But it was where she spoke Portuguese to me and spoke Spanish and we somehow met ourselves in the middle. Right, so being able to bring up this idea that there is a lot of diversity. I love the Zapotec, Chatino, Mixteco, absolutely variations of Spanish within that. Imposter syndrome. Many of us might not be native Spanish speakers and we might feel, well, I, I don't know if I can even put that on my resume yet, right? And not to say that we don't continue to build and learn how to do better, but a lot of times, I work with my students and I tell them, look, if my mom came to look for services, she will forgive you if you mess up one word versus the amount of work that it will take her to have to speak everything in English, right? Sometimes we're on vergüenza that we're gonna say the wrong thing and we won't explain it perfectly. Gets in the way of us doing what we need to do. Burnout is very real. I mean, we had an exodus of mental health providers during the uh, COVID pandemic. A lot of folks left the spaces of healing because we forgot to take care of the healers. The stigma and biases. And this last one is an incredibly important one to keep in mind as we continue to do this work. What is it that what I'm bringing in? What assumptions am I making before I sit with someone? Often I tell folks, uh, I identify as Afro-Latino, Costa Rican, and Panamanian. And if you have met me, You've met one Costa Rican. It does not mean that we get to a point where we actually know how to work with everyone that looks like X, Y, or C, right? So always being able to have that humble understanding of what it means to be a culturally sensitive provider. When it comes to bilingual and bicultural services, I think we've talked about this uh, a lot, right? But individuals with limited English proficiency are less likely to receive the mental health treatment they deserve and that creates barriers for them. Provider mental health services in a person's native language can improve treatment outcomes, buy-in and treatment engagement. Improving treatment outcomes by addressing cultural factors that may impact an individual's mental health, right? We cannot talk about someone's existence and mental health without talking about the context in which they exist. Reducing the health disparities and improving access to care for underserved populations, it starts with being able to do this. Right, and a lot of times it might take being uncomfortable. I often tell folks, immersion experiences, putting yourself in a space in which you feel othered will not give you the full experience of your patients, but it can help you to start understanding what it might be like to live that every single day. And lastly, there's a growing demand for culturally sensitive services. How do we integrate traditional healing methods? It is important for us to recognize that the most collectivistic, normal, natural way of being for people is to be with each other. If you're not gonna tell me that mental health and psychology have not learned how to rebox and repackage the simple ability to connect and talk to someone else, I don't know what is, right? And we don't only talk about that. You know, when we think about things like ACT, that is mindfulness at its best at the core of what it is. When we think about the four agreements, it is about making sure that we're paying attention to the way in which we think and the way in which we show up. Uh, the four agreements is something that I use in my clinical practice often as a traditional healing method. That's a whole presentation of its own. And if you don't know what the four agreements are, please put it on the chat. I'll make sure that I get Dr. O some, um, yeah, some information on that or an article or something that hopefully they can pass on to all of you. Now, we're talking about Latinx clients as a whole, but this literally applies to the whole entire world. When we talk about cultural values and the way in which we implement cultural values in our work, if this is not something that you're bringing to your day and day, uh, day in and day out, I think it's something that I wanna invite you to think through 
more intentionally. Cultural values such as familismo, right? In the Latino culture means that we center the family. So how are you including the family in some of the work that you're doing, right? This also shows respeto, right? So there's a high level of respect that we need to have in communication. There's a high level of respect that people are gonna bring the moment they walk into a room just because you carry the title of doctor, therapist, or mental health provider. Being able to recognize that power right and the respect that they're trying to provide us. Thirdly, things like fatalismo. Fatalismo tells us that a lot of folks say, well, you know, this is just something that happens or this is the burden that I have to carry, which means a lot of times we have a hard time asking for help. So being able to create space for that to exist while saying, and you deserve to be helped, and how do I show up for you differently that the system has? Sympatia and personalismo, relationship over task, right? It talks about the importance of being able to create space for us to talk. How are your kids? How is your wife, right? Instead of jumping right in into this, we gotta get something done quickly. Espiritualidad, creating space for there to be a relationship, whether it is with their religion, their God, or just nature as a whole. We don't have to be believers of X, Y, or C in order to support someone in their believing. Confianza. Again, how do we use the trust, which is so hard to get, and making sure we don't break that, right? It takes a long time to get someone's trust. It takes one bad interaction sometimes to break it. And the reality is that when they come to work with you, they're not seeing you for you. Instead, it's a whole entire system that time and time and time again has let them down in different ways. But when so no molestar, I think this is a big one, right? But when so that we need help, and this idea that we often we don't want to bother anybody, right? Very often I talk to clients that tell me. Well, I don't want to be a bother and there's probably someone else that needs more help than I do. So why should I take a spot? The ability to use faith, if that's a thing. And then thinking again in the way in which we communicate. High versus low, low context communication. High context communication is me telling you a whole entire story to get to the main thing that I wanted to tell you. But the reality is that there's important parts and important things that we need to hear out during that high context communication. Low context communication focuses on the task. What is it that we're getting done right now? And I understand that time becomes of the essence, right? But taking a couple minutes extra to allowing someone to just tell you how they got to where they're at might make the difference in maintaining that confianza, maintaining that personalismo alive. So again, this is not a all-inclusive list of everything that there is. But I think it's important for us to think of the ways in which we use it. Next, I invite you to think about not only viewing Latinx communities and folks as struggling and broken. I think often there's this narrative that is created through articles, that is created through the way in which we're portrayed in society, in media, that gives us this pobrecitos idea, right? Poor them. But in reality, there's a lot of strengths that folks bring into their work. Uh, Dr. Adamus and Chavez Duenas identified seven psychological strengths for Latinx individuals. But this is true for every single person that you work with, right? Dr. Joseph White was the first one to identify the seven psychologi psychological strengths of African-American folks, right? And what it meant to live from a place of strength while the history have told them over and over again that they were broken. More recently, through my dissertation, I identified the seven psychological strengths of undocumented students. And how do we use that to work with undocumented folks, specifically those that are neplanteros, right? Undocumented students are often ni de aquí ni de allá, but instead we are de aquí y de allá también, right? Both spaces being true to who we are. And how do we use those strengths to support them in the goals that they have? Secondly, we gotta think about the clinical approach that we bring and the lens that we use, thinking of things of being trauma responsive, using a multicultural feminist lens, being strength focused, liberatory in the work that we do, social justice driven, using narration because stories are important. It's the way in which we communicate as Latinx folks. 
CBT and ACT being things that we're able to mold and use regardless of cultural background. And lastly, if you haven't used it before, thinking of things like cultural mapping, right? Where do our, our identities and our clients' identities either come become bridges, points of connections, or barriers in the work that we're doing? If you have your phone, um, this is a link to the CIF, which is the a culturally responsive way of asking about mental health. What does your community call this thing that is happening and how do they usually respond to it, right? Allowing ourselves permission to not have to be the expert in the room, but instead of collaborate in the work that we're doing with someone else becomes key in being successful in the world and hopefully the outcomes that we wanna see. It also, it's also a way of empowering our clients to be able to see that where you might be needing help, you have also always had power. All right, second part of the presentation is gonna be on trauma responsive care and mental health. The first question that I have for y'all is trauma informed versus trauma responsive. What is the difference and why should we care? Thank you, Christina, for putting the four agreements on the chat. All right, given the time that we have, I'm gonna run through it. The latter is active versus passive. Thank you, Sabna. Absolutely, right? Trauma informed. I can be super informed about trauma. I could have read all the books. It doesn't mean that I'm showing up in a way in which I'm actually trying to respond to that trauma. So the next couple of slides is gonna tell us how to do exactly that. It's important for us to name that there's different types of trauma and just because you have had one does not mean that the other ones don't show up. And as a matter of fact, it is often common that there's multiple types of trauma uh, being represented. Single event, reoccurring event traumas, complex trauma often happening over and over again. And what does that mean? In a system in which uh, complex PTSD is not even recognized in the DSM historical intergenerational trauma and racial trauma. The trauma is pervasive. It can impact development and behavior, it has a far reaching and long lasting impact. For many folks, they don't recognize it as trauma because they haven't been given the words or the understanding of what that might mean. And it affects how clients approach services designed to help them. A lot of times a client's response to service that we might take personally might not be a response to us but it's just trauma showing up in different ways. When we talk about what is trauma, the short version of this is an event that is experienced and after it's experienced, it has negative lasting effects. This is from Samson. When we talk about trauma, there is a high prevalence of trauma in the United States. And I would say that that prevalence is even higher than what we think it is because it's often underreported. When we think about Latinx youth and experiences of trauma, a study by Ramirez in 2017 said that nearly four in five Latino youth suffer at least one traumatic childhood experience. And what that might mean for them and us is the providers who are trying to support and serve a growing Latinx population. When we look inside the brain of an individual after they have had a trauma experience, their nervous system changes. We experience the world literally differently. Through a traumatic event, the action of the brain takes control, shifting the body into reactive survival mode. It shuts down all the non-essential body and mind processes, right? The sympathetic nervous system increases and all of a sudden we are in flight, flee or freeze. And recently someone told me, fun and friend, which I still need to look into, but right, like it's just very biological response to fear. And we see it in the way in which people also respond uh, to the services that we're trying to provide. And if we think of flight, fight, and freeze as physical, withdrawal, or constricting, we start seeing some of these behaviors that are not just literally the words that they mean, right? Avoid, uh, when it comes to flight, Aggression, trouble concentrating, like hyperactivity or explosiveness. When it comes to flight, isolation, avoidance of others, constantly running away, 
or freeze, constricted emotional expression, stealing behaviors, and overcompliance or denials of our own physical needs. It's also important for us to learn the technical diagnosis of PTSD. Make sure that we know what's the language that's used and then recognize that often that's not enough. This is important for multiple reasons. One, misdiagnosis is common. It is more likely for people from global majorities, immigrants especially, to be misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed when it comes to PTSD. Why? Because one of the symptoms of PTSD is this negative perspective or unsafe view of the world. So what happens when you're an immigrant? We're living traumatic, violent experiences before migration. You have experienced trauma through migration. You come into the United States and there's still traumatic things happen. And someone asks you, how are things? And you go, you know what? I'm just blessed. I am so happy that I'm here. Like I'm trying to work through some things and like whatever it is, I have able to provide a better opportunity for my, for my family and my children. So I go, oh, well, not, not PTSD. They, they didn't say that the world sucks and that they have seen so many horrible things, right? How much of that is literally connected to having a positive outlook in life? This idea of incredible immigrant resilience and hope that they needed in order to make it all the way here, right? So we are pathologizing without looking at the strengths that they bring in their own experiences. Sometimes we have discovered something else and we hyper-focus on that one thing, which don't, doesn't allow us to see that, oh, the depression or anxiety that you may be feeling might also be connected to a traumatic experience. And typically they don't show up alone. Often I have clients ask me, so Dr. Rojas Arauz, what, what is the typical response to trauma? And the only thing that I have learned so far is that the typical response to trauma is recovery. Outside of that, everything is fair. Trauma triggers are reminders that are often not clear, often unnoticed, right? It can be invisible, it can seem trivial and minor, it can be a color, it can be a brand. It doesn't always have to make sense. And sometimes we're not even aware that it's happening. It's important for us to normalize and validate this experience for our clients because many times they're learning this with us, right? It's also important to recognize that not always we'll be the ones to finish all of the treatment with someone that we're working. Sometimes we'll start that work and we're gonna have to do a warm handoff, hopefully, to the next provider that will be able to do that soul work. Sometimes in integrated behavioral health, what we're doing is trying to help people function so they can continue to the next thing and hopefully continue to the next provider. Also, differentiating between PTSD, trauma, and anything bad. Traumas do not always lead to PTSD. Traumas may lead to PTSD, but then the person may be able to recover. And there is many things that happen to people that can be deeply, deeply painful that we don't consider traumas. An example of this is racial trauma. According to the BCSDSM description of what trauma is, is a life my apologies, my Alexa is talking to me without, Alexa off. Okay, my apologies, I don't know what happened there. Um, trauma, racial trauma is often not, doesn't fall under PTSD because maybe your life was not threatened at the moment, right? But it's like a microaggression. A microaggression might not kill you by itself but a thousand times over, it will have a long lasting impact that is traumatic. Sometimes we are ahead of the books that we used to tell us how we're supposed to be moving into in specific spaces. I think it's important for us to use evidence-based practices, but just importantly to use practice-based evidence that might not be found in the books that we read or the trainings that we got before going into the field. At the end of the day, we can agree that Trauma does not discriminate. It can happen to anyone at any given moment. Individuals who have recently migrated from areas of social unrest might have higher levels of PTSD. However, it does not mean 
there has not been anything that shows that there is a higher susceptibility for ethnic or minority groups. I think there is a higher level of systemic racism that might expose us to more traumatic events. But I think even when we talk about that, how do we give society their part and responsibility in the traumatic experiences of the populations we serve? All right, y'all. I know it's been a marathon and I have thrown a lot of things at y'all. We're getting to the end of this. I'm talking about trauma responsive care and vicarious trauma. Let me see what's in here. It says trauma responsive care is compassionate care. It is an approach, not an intervention. So whatever kind of therapist you call yourself, I'm a CBT, I'm a uh, narrative, I use Gestalt, whatever it is that you use in your practice, you can become a trauma responsive uh, provider, right? It's the way in which we approach healing and we support resilience and all that. Why trauma responsive services, recovery and healing are possible. And it's important for us to be hope dealers in the work that we do. Make sure that we're able to pass that on to the folks that may be feeling like there is nothing that they can possibly do to feel better. There's also protective fa factors that facilitate healing and resilience. Healing occurs with the context of relationship and it's important for us to center that. So what does it mean to provide trauma responsive services? It means that we deliver services that take into account and acknowledge the role of trauma in the way in which people seek and engage with services. It is having a young man coming into my office the very first day and telling me, F you, F this, I don't need to be here. And for me to be able to hear that and say, okay, I can hear it, I can sit with it. I know you have to be here, so what do we do next? It is easy for us to feel that it's a personal attack at us. Why are you cussing me out? I'm just trying to help. Right, like we don't get stars for trying to be good people. So being able to just be in the space and centering that we are here to help. And many times what they're trying to say is like, well, you're gonna be like everybody else that gets a little bit scared if I throw a couple of F-bombs around. Trauma responsive professionals appreciate the high relevance of traumatic experiences among clients. They understand the profound neurological, biological, and social effects of trauma. They recognize and address how trauma comes into the space and are collaborative and supportive in the way in which they show up. There is six key principles that SAMHSA talks about in relation to trauma, which is safety, collaboration, voice and choice, trustworthiness, peer support, and cultural and historical identity issues. I'm looking at the time and we're running towards the end. I will send uh, Dr. O a handout, or if you'll just look up uh, six key principles from SAMHSA, you'll be able to find a quick uh, article on it. Uh, when it comes to safety, safety precedes learning. If someone doesn't feel safe, they won't be able to learn. Fear overrides ability to think clearly. Behaviors communicate feelings. Environment and activities can be calming. Relationships can be healing. Nonverbals are powerful and teamwork and shared responsibility are vital. At the end of the day, we're able to do this better if we're able to connect across systems. It's also important for us to be intentional with the words and the way in which we talk about trauma. How do we move from what is wrong with you? Why would you come into my office and start cussing me out to what happened to you? That this is the space in which we're starting. It's important for us to think in the way in which disclosures might happen, right? Be prepared. A lot of times disclosures are unexpected. It's important for us to make sure that there is agency policies and protocols. What if the trauma that was just um, shared with you is a CPS report, right? How do we navigate that with our clients in a way that is trauma-informed? Also, if we realize that we might not be the ones that be it, to be able to help this client all the way through, that we have the referrals that we need available. The strategies on how to do this could be as follow. Regulate, relate, and reason. First, we say regulate. 
Make sure that we pay attention to things like the environment. Create a quiet, safe space, thinking about the light, the smells. Secondly, bring intentional mindfulness to the work that you're doing. Manage your own reactions. Be mindful of the way in which you ask questions. In a lot of ways, just listen. Try to figure out what it is the behavior communicating instead of trying to label it. Validate and normalize that trauma is hard. Limit questions, simply listen. And lastly, skill build. There's a lot of things that we're able to do uh, when it comes to imagery, mindful breathing, yoga, exercise, movement, psychoeducation. Secondly, relate. Create a mindful co connection. Make sure that you're able to regulate first, but then relate to your client. Pay attention to your tone and voice. Think about the client's relational needs. Listen without trying to solve. And make sure that you earn their trust over and over and over again. And lastly, reason. So reframe negative behaviors, review strategies, emphasize the ability to make changes, foster hope, become a hope dealer, celebrate their culture, celebrate their strengths, celebrate their insights. And make sure that you're providing them with the tools that they need to move forward. Trauma informed or trauma denied. Traditional services and models often deny or minimize experiences of trauma, which leads to re traumatization, lack of effective treatment. In contrast, there's many things that we can do to help someone feel safe, make it feel like they have choice, feel empowered, and in a way in which we collaborate with our clients. Dr. O. I'm still like two minutes from you, but we're going to go to vicarious trauma and talking about how do we take care of the healers. And again, this is going to be quick. The most important thing is recognizing that vicarious trauma can also be a tool. It doesn't have to be good or bad. We don't have to put a name on it or label it. It simply is. It is contagious. It is pervasive. And more than likely, we'll experience it if we're trying to work with communities that have histories of trauma. It's important for us to also recognize that to be curious trauma, we're able to develop empathy and understanding. Sometimes we're able to develop skills that will help, if not this client, the one that comes after. But we cannot do that without awareness. Taking care of ourselves is the most important thing. If I was to ask you, and if we had a little bit more time, I would have said, what are some of the things that your families and your communities deal with? Often things like lack of time, injustice in the system, requirements, human struggles, such as homelessness, grief, loss, trauma, poverty, conflicts in the family. Many of them have just survived a global pandemic. Sometimes we take too long to get to them. And these are the demands and the challenges they're facing. And then I ask you, what are the demands and experiences and challenges that you face? And we could almost copy and paste the exact same list onto this. Right, it's important for us to take care of the healers as well. And a way in which we do that is thinking about how do we empower providers? And we can do that in multiple ways. This right here is an empowerment wheel. The first thing is informed consent, making sure that we go into an agreement with the clients that we work. Secondly, supervision and consultation, that you have someone that can support you so you don't feel like you have to go through these things alone. Hopefully each of you can think of a supervisor that is ready and is available and capable to support you in the ways that you need to. Number three is a huge one that I think that often we overlook, which is how we redefine success. Often people tell me, well, clients come back or clients are learning what we're teaching them or I'm liked by my clients. Maybe, but that's external validation that often we might not get, right? All of those things actually is not in our power to control. So I ask you to think of your success in being, I showed up, I came prepared, I was kind, caring, and present. I was able to give my best. I provided the tools. Whether someone uses them or not cannot be your measurement of success because that will lead to burnout. If I could only feel successful, if all of my clients liked me, if always showed up, always did their homework, and learn all the things that I did, 
I can tell you without a doubt, I have been an unsuccessful provider for about 11 years, right? Making sure that we have a clear role and we stay at the top of our role, right? How do we do that in a way that makes sense? Thinking of healthy boundaries, the only people that don't want to respect the, your boundary, the, the only people that have a problem with your boundaries are the ones that don't want to respect them, right? So what does that mean in work settings? Are we able to ask for time to take care of ourselves? And when we think about self-care, I always ask my students to pay themselves first. What does that mean? You have 168 hours every single week, regardless of who you are. Often I ask, what are the things that need to happen within those 168 hours? People name work, transportation, shower, self-hygiene, and the list goes on. Often what doesn't make it onto that list is self-care. It's the last thing we add in. I wanna challenge you and invite you to make it the first thing you actually bring in. That at the beginning of the week, you're able to block an hour, half an hour or 10 minutes, whatever it is that your time is able to give you. And that you protect that the same way you protect your work, your classes and your clients' time. It becomes a practice. And a lot of times it's a hard practice to live by. We come from families, that have told us about self-care is and the culture within our families of what it means to take care of ourselves. We live in a society in which tells us that it is selfish or waste of time. And often we gotta think about the culture within the places in which we work, which is bringing all these other people into a single space to do this. In order for us to take care of ourselves, we gotta be able to be aware of where we're at, understand what are the symptoms of vicarious trauma. By in balance, we cannot give from an empty cup, no podemos dar de un vaso vacío. And it shouldn't be that we grab this cup and we pour into it, but instead we fill our cup to a point so much that it overflows into the cup that we're holding beneath. And the same way that we heal others through our connections to them, we heal ourselves through connection. Think of the A dimension of wellness and the ways in which you take care of yourselves. And thank you all for sitting with me for this last hour. I appreciate y'all. Thank you so, so much. That was, there was so much in there. I know we, we've only got about three minutes left, so probably not much time for questions, but um, I just, I want you like, I think you're getting a lot of love right now. <laughs> like, and really that empowerment wheel that you closed with. One of the questions I was having as you were talking, like you talked about the exodus of providers, right? And then thinking about like what, uh, you know, what's helped you stay in. And it seems like this framework has been really helpful for you. Yes, for sure. no, I, yeah. I've, absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to try to answer any question. Also, the QR code at the end is for a quick survey, not the one that's going to get you GEs. So make sure you do that one as well. This one is yes for me. What did you get from today's presentation? What did you need more of? Anything else you want to tell me in relation to that? And I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, you know, I there. haven't seen any come into the Q&A. Um, I think okay. folks were maybe just focused in on you right now. So yeah, I will just sort of clarify that. So the QR code that's up there, um, if you want to share specific feedback, that's going to go directly to a presenter. That's where you do that. And then the, um, the links that uh, Christina has been posting in the chat are if you're a HRSA recipient or if you wanted those CEUs for today, make sure you click that link because that's the only way we know you were here and can give you the credit for it and you'll get those certificates. So that will come. Also just, we do record all of these and the Spanish language channel of them as well. They get posted to our YouTube channel and you can always access that at our website. I know the website has gone up in there, but it's ibhequity.sfsu.edu. So you'll be able to access this and come back. There was so, so, so much amazing stuff in here, right? Everything from what is trauma? How do we do that? And where do clients access this? How do we show up? How do we like, I thought Alexa coming in when you were trying to talk about racial discrimination, or like racial trauma, you know, so just so much, everything that you hit on could be a whole uh, class in and of itself. And so thank you for sharing so much of this and also, you know, weaving in your personal experiences with the clients that you've been working with. It was so powerful and we're so appreciative of you. Um, yeah, no, thank so you. far, the only question has been, will the recording be on YouTube? And yes, it will. So with that, we don't want to take any more of your time. Thank you. You've been amazing. It usually takes a couple of weeks for um, our technology assistant to get that up onto YouTube to edit it and those things. But it will be there. If you want to know when it's available, subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
I sound like a, now I'm like Gen Z or right? Like and subscribe, but uh, that's mm -hmm. us. <laughs> we also have a LinkedIn community of folks who are interested in this. And that's also a nice place where you can come and join us. So um, lots of ways to stay connected. Thank you, thank you, thank you again so much for your time. Really, really appreciate all the work that you're doing and everything you've done. Okay, thank you. And please do reach out if there's anything I can do to support. Um, it has definitely taken a lot of people for me to be here and can never pay it back and always pay it forward. So we'll do that. I love that. All right. Have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone.